but he can be seated. I'll be reading from the second chapter of Nehemiah here in just a few minutes. But I want to talk about tonight rebuilding and building, rebuilding a day at a time. Rebuilding a day at a time. How many of y'all heard that old song we sang for years? One day at a time, sweet Jesus. That's all I'm asking of you. Give me the strength to do every day what I need to do or have to do. Praise God. That's what we need. Is just give us that strength, Lord, one day at a time. Rebuilding a day at a time. How many of y'all know that if you're going to rebuild something, you first need to look at it? First need to survey it, don't you? And see what kind of damage you have, what kind of shape you have. I, I can certainly tell you from my experience in remodeling houses that uh, a complete restoration or a remodeling job doesn't happen overnight. It takes a day or two or three or a week or it takes a good while sometimes if you're going to redo a whole house it takes a while so let me ask you a simple little question why do we expect our marriage to be rebuilt overnight if it's been in trouble why do we expect our life to be rebuilt in one day if we've had problems in our life um yeah, you can see a significant difference sometimes, uh, but you know it's not the way it should be yet. And so we get aggravated sometimes because it hadn't, it hadn't completely worked out yet. But you've got to understand it takes time to have that good marriage. It takes time to have that uh, relationship with the Lord. And when you think about your relationship with God, you just don't automatically become a strong Christian. Even when you just get in church, you're still not a strong Christian, are you? It takes time. A, a day at a time. In fact, uh, some of you, y'all know what it's like to, to get in church and become a Christian, and the next day it seems like you fall back down. You don't become a strong Christian overnight. But don't you think by praying and reading the Word that you... When you read the word, you are surveying your life and you're seeing the damage and God is causing you to see the imperfections in your life. The light of the Holy Ghost has been shined in your life and you see where you need repairs. You see where you need to grow stronger in God. When I read Nehemiah chapter 2, I see Nehemiah going out and surveying the damage of the walls. Um, I've gone and looked at some houses before and I've said, I've gone to some of them and I said, there's no hope. You know, this, this is, uh, we need a dozer. And, uh, it needs to be just dozed down. Uh, sometimes I've looked at them and I've had to tear out walls because the termites had, had damaged it so bad there was nothing to do but tear it out or floor. I, I bought a house up on the mountain and, and tore out the bathroom walls and sure enough, I had to tear it all the way to the outside and redo the walls because of termite damage. But that floor sometimes has to be torn completely out. There's no repairing it just because it's weak in spots and you, you tear into it and you find out that the floor joist is gone, so you've got to repair it. Uh, just a few days ago, I went out to get the lawnmower out of the shed to take it across to get it repaired and, and uh, I fell through the floor. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank God it wasn't but about five inches that I had to fall. But, uh, and then I had a hard time getting the lawnmower out because the floor had just given way. And, you know, uh, so three days later I had a new floor in there. And that's the way it is. Sometimes you just got to tear it out. So Nehemiah goes to Jerusalem and he studies the damage for three days going out at night and inspecting the damage. And finally he gathers everybody together Chapter 2, verse 17, 18, 19, and 20. Then said I unto them, You see the distress that, ye, that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. 
Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Ooh, I like that. It said the preacher didn't have to lay hands on them to strengthen them. They got excited to go to work. And, and, and they said, so they strengthened their hands by knowing that they were going to do a good work. And when Sanballat, the Horniite, and Tobiah, the servant, the Amorite, uh, and Jeshem, and, and Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? Then answered I them and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will rise and build. But you don't even have a portion or right nor memorial in Jerusalem. It ain't got nothing to do with you. Amen. That's what they're saying. It ain't got anything to do with you. This is just about us. Wow. Um, can I say this? No matter what the ruin of any life, doesn't matter what has happened, there is always a place to start. Amen. 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 Uh, there's a place where you must begin. Maybe you have to apologize to somebody. Maybe you have to go to someone and straighten something out. Maybe you have to open yourself up to, to some counseling. Or you need to seek advice. Maybe you have to stop something that you've been doing that's wrong. But there's always a first step. There's always a place that you can start. Nehemiah went and surveyed the damage and then he found a place to start. And I want to tell you, we must pray for God to help us and give us strength and determine in our mind to take that first step and do something for God. To change the situation. Amen. Now, Chapter 3 gives us an outline of how the walls and the gates were built. And listen, y'all, it was a day-by-day -day rebuilding. Sometimes it was easy, and, uh, and some days you had a weapon in your hand and a hammer, and other days you, you had a, a hammer or a trial in your hand, but you always had your weapon in your hand because you was expecting war. But, but you know, that's also the way our, our Christian life is. We're not going to get everything perfect, but we can fight to rebuild our life one day at a time. Some days you feel like, Lord, I'm, I, I've been fighting the enemy all day. I've got a sword in one hand and, and, and I'm building this life with the other. You know, I, I, I've got a hammer in one hand and a sword in one hand. I've got a trial. I've got a saw. I've got a hammer in one hand and I'm fighting the enemy with the other. Some days he just bombards us, doesn't he? The old enemy, he's a sly old fox. I've heard that all the time. He's a sly one and, and he's always fighting against us. But one day at a time, if we keep building, we're eventually going to get the wall built. Amen? Now, I got to reading today and studying, and, and, I, and after looking at, at, at everybody's, uh, uh, I guess, their view about this wall, it was somewhere between uh, two and, and two and a half miles uh, square, this wall that they built in 52 days. Nine feet tall, about approximately nine feet tall and, and three feet wide. Now, others, other descriptions on the, the big outer wall, it was like 26 to 29 feet wide uh, or eight feet wide and 29 feet tall. Uh, you know, th these are some monster walls. But uh, in building those walls, it wasn't done in a day. And building our life with God, it's not done in a day. How many of y'all realize you're stronger now than you were last year? Amen. It didn't happen overnight, though. It took one day at a time. Don't expect your life to be in, in a, in a, uh, so perfect with God all at one time. We're never going to get perfect anyhow. Come on. 
But we are going to get stronger in God one day at a time. Now, chapter 3 is about building the gates. And they built them a day at a time. Have you, has anybody read this enough to, to know how many gates there were in this wall around Jerusalem? Does anybody know? No, more than 12. Huh? There's 10. 10 gates. Can anybody name them? Uh, okay, I'll name them. There was a sheep gate, a fish gate. If you look it up, it's, it's all in the third chapter here. The old gate, the valley gate, the dung gate, the fountain gate, the water gate. Oh, no, it's not the one with Nixon. No, no. The horse gate, the east gate, and the inspection gate. And honestly, y'all, I've read the book of Nehemiah many times. And I knew about the ten gates. But I had never stopped to think that they might have a spiritual meaning. I just thought they had names, you know, sheep gate, fish gate, but I never stopped to think about the meaning of them. But as I, I've mentioned before, and, and, and uh, Brother Osborne has, has told me this in, in ministry, that you always look behind the story, look past the obvious, because the story is probably about the obvious, but there's always something hid behind it. There's a hidden story. There's a hidden meaning. There's a gold nugget, nugget, and you just have to dig out that nugget. It's hid. So let me say this. These gates could represent the journey of the Christian or the journey of the church. Now I looked at that today, and, and this is basically what Nehemiah's wall, and I, I wanted to have it on the screen tonight, but we, uh, we didn't. We need to get it for you. So I, I, I've got a picture here. of This is what the wall looked like around Jerusalem. And then later, they built a bigger wall that, that even was around this. And that's the one that was eight and a half feet thick and 29 feet tall. But, uh, but this was the wall. And these are the gates uh, and how they're, how they're lined up. And, and the first thing, the Bible says that, that the, the, first, the first gate that he, he came to uh, was the sheep gate. And I got to thinking about that. The, the sheep gate. And, and honestly, y'all, this is some stuff that I've, I've never even thought about. I, I got to studying about this today and looking at it, and I, I've never, never even thought about this. And they started working first on the sheep gate, which, was, which is right here, the very top. And here, here's the temple right here in the center. That's where it ought to be. The temple ought to be, the church ought to be at the center of your life. Okay, good. But I, I've never thought about this. The, the sheep gate, it was called the sheep gate because that was where they brought the sheep and lambs in for the sacrifice. Have you ever thought about the fact that the very first experience we come to in our Christian life is that Jesus is the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. The sheep gate represents the cross and the sacrifice that was made for our sins. It is the starting point of everything, isn't it? Amen. Don't you think spiritually that you should start your day at the starting point? Amen. Because everything starts with Jesus and ends with Jesus. Everything starts with the cross and should end with Jesus' death on the cross. Listen, you can't rebuild your life without Jesus. You'll never make it to the next gate without Jesus. Amen. You'll never make it one day at a time without Jesus. If I say amen. amen. Now the next gate, and, and notice too that, the, that, that they don't go clockwise. They go counterclockwise. I think there's something hidden there. I'm going to get one of these days. I think there's something to it that they're going uh, counterclockwise instead of clockwise. And, and the next gate that they come to is the fish gate. Uh, the sheep gate 
represents the cross and the sacrifice. But the next gate mentioned is the fish gate, Nehemiah 3 and 3. It was called the fish gate because that's where the fishermen of Galilee would bring their catch in through the gates to be sold. So for the Christian that speaks of evangelism, all of us have been called to be what? Fishers of men. Amen. It should be that once we see that Jesus died for our sins, that we would want to tell others what Jesus did for us. Would you think about the church in the book of Acts? The believers turned the world upside down, didn't they? The message of Jesus Christ, they had a great message to minister. They were fishers of men, and we should be too. Amen. Then you have the third gate. It was called the old gate. And it's right here. The old gate. Um, it's in Nehemiah 3 and 6 where it talks about it. It was probably one of the original gates. Maybe it wasn't burned too bad. It was repaired according to verse 6. The old gate in our Christian walk could refer to the old paths that Jeremiah spoke about in, in chapter 6 and verse 16. Thus saith the Lord, stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk therein and you will find rest for your soul. See, Jeremiah 6 would have would have never been uh, it would have never been burned if the Israelites had done what they were supposed to do. See, they, they decided that they wouldn't keep the old paths. So they started worshiping everything else. Cows and fish and Dagon. They started worshiping in the groves to their false gods. Y'all, God still wants to be number one, don't He? We replace Him every day, it seems like, with, with our jobs. People replace God every day with jobs and careers and pills and pot and beer and alcohol and pornography. All of these are substitute for the real God. We get high on the wrong stuff. Come on. These things are Satan's inventions to mock the high God that we have, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's a, everything that he's created, all of these things that Satan has created is meant to take the place of God in our lives. What we've got to do is get back to the old past. It might take him going back to door number one, to gate number one, you know, going back to Jesus, the supreme sacrifice. It might take going back to him. Jesus, God in flesh, our supreme sacrifice, and let us worship Him. We need to get Him first in our life, don't we? Yes. Next, Jeremiah mentions the valley gate in, in verse 13. This gate opened up to the valley of Hinnom. The valley gate was a long way from the old gate. Had to travel some distance to get to this old, or, or to this uh, valley gate. And maybe that symbolizes the walk of a new Christian when you first get in church. You know, everything's going good. It's like honeymoon time. Yeah. Man, you can't get enough church, it seems like. And, and everybody's fighting against you, but still you're on cloud nine. You don't notice nothing. You don't, you don't know. You can't find no cobwebs in the church. You can't find nothing wrong with the people. They're all great. Amen. Everything looks good because you're on honeymoon. Y'all know what I'm talking about. When you're on honeymoon, everything's great and glorious. You ain't come back to real life yet. And the bills, you've got phone bills and electric bills and all that stuff. And card payments. Well, I didn't know we had all of that when we got married. Welcome to the real world. We didn't know it either, did we? But we found out. You can't have no phone without a bill. That's right. Yeah. And we didn't, have, we didn't have cell phones back then. We just had, uh, I can tell you all a story right here, but I, I need to go on. Um, it was like, it, you know, it was like it was a honeymoon time when, you know, where God, God teaches you about his presence and 
His presence is strong in your life. And oh, you're just worshiping Him and having a good time. You're, you're walking with Christ and talking with Him. And you're saying, wow, this is the, this is the greatest experience. This is the greatest time of my life. And, you know, you're kind of walking on clouds. You know, everything everything is great. But then you come to the valley or the valley gate. How many of y'all ever been in a valley? How many of you ever been in a spiritual valley? Can I just tell you, you're not always going to be on the mountaintop? Huh? You're going to have some low times. The valley speaks of a time of humbling and trials and personal growth. People who want to stay high on drugs or other stuff all the time are afraid of real life. Right. Come on. I can't face the fact that my kids are growing up. I can't face, face the fact that I'm getting older. Where, where did my good life go? What happened to the young days? Now it's just work, work, work. You can't face the facts of real life. It, but I want to tell you, it's not about you anymore. What, you know, the honeymoon's over. It's not about necessarily you anymore. Amen? There's some valleys that we're going to have to go through in our Christian walk as, as well as in our natural life. Growth is not easy, y'all, but it's necessary. Nothing grows on the mountaintop. Do you know that? Everybody say, it's too rocky. Oh, that reminds me of a song. Nothing grows on old rocky top. The dirt's too rocky by far. That's what I heard. Come on now. It's too rocky. Everything grows in the valley, but nothing grows on the mountaintop. That, I mean, that's worth eating. And that's the way it is spiritually. We always produce fruit when we're in the valley. Why have I got to go through this trial, this test? Because you've got to grow. The only way you're going to grow is to go through the valley. Listen, don't take this wrong. It's not right to stay in the valley of depression. Come on, that's good preaching. These are valleys of growth. And there are valleys of depression where there is no growth. You can only stay in the valley so long, and then you've got to move on. Amen. Come on. Nehemiah had a burden for a while, didn't he? But then he got up and started doing something. He grew. He, he fasted and he prayed, and he got that burden. He said, I've got to do something with this burden. Listen, you can, you can be down in the, in the mully grubs for a little while, but God's wanting to push you on to something greater. You're in that valley to experience greater things. You're there to experience growth. Yes. So you can only stay in that valley so long. I noticed that Nehemiah didn't stop his writing about the gates when he came to the valley gate. Oh, I'm going to stop right here. I've, I've seen enough of these gates. Man, I'm, I'm having a tough time here. Some people, when they come to the valley gate or, or the valley, they want to stay there way too long. That's depression. It's not of God. Don't stay there. Get up and get going. Amen? Nehemiah tells us about the next gate, and it's the dung gate. Kind of strange that it's next. All of Jerusalem's rubbish was taken out this gate and down to the valley of Hinnom and buried. Or burned, I'm sorry. This is where the rubbish of our lives uh, is gotten rid of. Those valley experiences are used by the Lord to clear away the rubbish. Amen. So that true faith refined by fire can come forth and produce fruit. There will be some things in our lives that we're going to have to get rid of. Would you say amen? amen? There will be some things that need to be burned up. If you don't surrender those things to God, they're going to pull you down and you'll never turn the corner to victory in your life until you let those things go. Amen. So there's that done gate, a place to get rid of all that stuff you don't need in your life. Amen. When you look at the, uh, at the picture uh, after the dung gate where you leave some things behind and you turn the corner and you start going up. 
After you get rid of some things in your life, the next move that you make is up. Amen. After you get rid of those things that need your life needs to be cleansed of, there ain't no way to go but up. Woo, that's good, ain't it? We need to start getting rid of some things so we if you find yourself depressed too long, you need to find the dumb gate and get rid of some things and start climbing up. Amen. Uh, that's, that's pretty deep right there. Isn't it? Wow. Uh, get rid of some things in your life and, and start climbing and going up in God instead of being depressed. Um, you start going up and you start climbing and the next thing you know you're at the fountain gate the fountain gate and uh, talks about it in verse 15 was located near the pool of Siloam where people went for cleansing before proceeding to the temple listen once you clean some things out of your life the Holy Ghost like a river it, it washes over us and empowers us for a Christian walk. Jesus said in John 7, 38, Whosoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Amen. 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 So we need to, we need to find that, that gate and, and let the waters rush over us and, and, and cleanse us and, and get us where we need to be in God. We need those rivers of living water. Then after the fountain gate came the water gate. Verse 26. The water gate led down to the Gahon Spring, which was located adjacent to the Kidron Valley. The water gate is a picture of the Word of God. Amen. Ephesians 5, 26 states that Jesus wants to keep cleansing us with the washing of the Word. Wow. Do y'all realize how important it is for us to read the Word? Yes. How important it is for us to study the Word because it washes us. Y'all you know, have baptized people two and three times before because they wanted to be rebaptized because they maybe had backslid. But I told them right up front, it's not necessary to be baptized again. Oh, but I want to be baptized, but nothing do but you baptize them again. And I guess maybe if they don't read the word, maybe they do need to be rebaptized. Huh? Because the word is what cleanses us. If we stay in the word, it cleanses us. Amen. We need that initial baptism because the Lord gave us that for an example. He was baptized, so we need to be baptized too. It's a death, burial, and resurrection. But after that time, you need to be cleansed all the time by the word. Would you say amen? The word purifies. If you hide the word in your heart, it will purify you. Wow. No wonder he said hide the word in your heart. It never stops working. Right. Woo, hallelujah. It never stops. The cleansing never stops. If you keep reading the word, the word just keeps on cleansing us and makes us what we need to be. Praise God. Even when you don't even see it, it's working. <laughs> Praise God. You need the Word. No wonder the devil don't want you reading the Word. If you hate the Word, or if you hide the Word in your heart, you will not sin against God. Woo, that's pretty strong, isn't it? That Psalms, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, Psalms 119 and 11. The house gate was next after the water gate. The house gate was mentioned in uh, verse 28. It speaks of warfare. It was close to the king's stables. The men of Jerusalem would ride their horses out this gate to war. Listen to me. Rest assured that if you read the word of God and you become a Christian, you are going to face spiritual warfare. That's the reason I, I talked about it uh, a couple of weeks ago. When you get up in the morning, you need to put on the whole armor of God. We are not fighting flesh and blood, but it's spiritual warfare. Could I say this? If your family is living for God, then y'all need to quit fighting amongst yourselves. We are fighting a spiritual battle. Amen. We are fighting against evils and principalities and powers and, 
the wicked wickedness all over. You can stop the enemy by praying and praying the word of God. Amen. Amen. We need to realize that we are not supposed to be fighting against one another. Listen, we're all Christians. If we got a good Christian family, we're all Christians, and one may not be as high up as the other. One may be a little weaker than the other. But if we stay in the Word, we need to realize that, thank God, the Word cleanses us all the time, and the Word will reveal to us where we need to move up in God, and the Word will reveal to us that we shouldn't be fighting among ourselves, but it's the enemy that's causing the problems. It's the enemy that's sowing tares in the family. Amen. You need to realize where that's coming from and take up the sword which is the word of God. Amen. Take that sword up every day when you get up. Put on the whole armor of God because you know you're going to do battle with the enemy. Come on. The next gate is the east gate. The east gate was located on the opposite side of the Mount of Olives. It faced the east. And it was shut. Ezekiel 44, 1 through 3. Could we read that? Somebody turn to that. Ezekiel 44, 1 through 3. Anybody got it? Then he brought me back me back the way of the gate of the outward sanctuary which looked toward the east and it was shut. Then said the Lord unto me, This gate shall be shut, it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter in it by it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it, therefore it shall be shut. It is for the prince, the prince, he shall sit in it to eat bread before the Lord, he shall enter by the way of the porch of that gate, and shall go out by the, by the way of the same. When Jesus returns, y'all, he's going to enter Jerusalem by this east gate. Amen. Zechariah 4.14 also tells us that he will come to Jerusalem on the east, uh, the Mount of Olives, by, uh, to Jerusalem on the east. As Christians, we should be looking and hoping for the Lord's return. In fact, 2 Timothy 4.8 tells us that there's going to be a crown given to those who are looking for his appearing. It's a crown of righteousness for those who are looking for His appearance. Y'all, every day we ought to be looking for the Lord. How many of y'all want a crown? Amen. Every day we ought to be looking for the Lord's appearing. Amen. Where a crown is going to be given for us for just looking for the Lord. Uh, we, we sing about it. This could be the cloud that he's coming back on. This could be the day. You know, we've got all kinds of things that we sing about it. But are we really expecting the Lord to come back? Well, I don't know if he can come today or not. I, he can come. How many of y'all knew there was an earthquake this morning? About 3 o'clock. Earthquake. You know, a lot of times while we're sleeping, you know, earthquakes take place. And we don't even know about it. That's, you know, that's the way the Lord can come. We are to be expecting him. He could come. Uh, he could come at any moment. Amen. Uh, we are to be expecting him. He is. He promised to come back, didn't he? He has promised to come and get his church. I don't know about y'all, but I want to be in that number. Amen. 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 The last, the last three gates are, are close together here because it's symbolic of the events that are going to happen so quickly. The Lord comes back to the Mount of Olives, and and then the wrath of God, war, and then the inspection or the judgment. And lastly is the inspection gate in verse 31. This is where King David would meet his troops for inspection. Spiritually, though, it is the examination of our lives by the Lord. Y'all, do you understand that we are all called to live our lives with eternity in view. We ought to be caring more about the things of eternity than the temporary things of this world. All of this is going to pass away. Amen. Those things that, that we have invested in so heavily in this, in this life, 
they're all going to pass away. And only what you've done for the Lord is going to last. And he's going to examine our lives. I don't know about you, but I want him to be pleased with my life. Amen, I do. I, that's the reason every day that I live, I, I'm trying to, to live the way I think the Lord would want me to live. It's important. We are called to live our lives with, you know, the things of heaven on our mind. The things of God on our mind. What would God want me to do? What, how would He want me to react to this? What would He want me to say in this situation? All of these things are, are, are temporary. You know, we, oh, I've got this I've got to do. I've got to go do that. I've got, you know, when you're on your deathbed, none of those things are important anymore. You're not even thinking about those things because you've got your mind on something else further away. And that is on the Lord Jesus Christ. The most important thing that our minds should be stayed on is Him. He's coming back after His church. We ain't got time to dilly dally around. We ain't got time to be worried about this and worried about that. Sure, I know we gotta we gotta occupy until the Lord's come and until He comes. But you gotta understand something. There is something more important than that, and that is get ready. God is coming back. Be expecting Him. Amen. I don't know about you, but I can I can see the things right now. This world's not here for long. I don't know if y'all looked around lately, but I see all the signs of the end time around us. And I realize now more than ever that God is soon coming for His church. I don't know the day or the hour, but I do want to be ready. I can see the end is fast approaching. Yeah, I've seen a few years in my life, but I've never seen a time, and, and, and even in, in, in earlier times, oh, this is the fulfilling of the Word. This is the fulfilling of the Word, and it was. All of these things had to happen in order to get us to this point, but now that I'm at this point, I realize, wow, He's really close by. He's really getting ready to come and get His church. Hey, we need to wake up and realize it can be any moment. It can happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. He can catch us out of this world. And I want to be in that number. But I tell you how we live our lives. A day at a time. Let's rebuild our lives one day at a time. Let's live closer to God today than we lived yesterday. Let's read more of the Word than we did yesterday. Let's have a relationship with God like we've never had before. And we do it one day at a time, getting closer to God every day. Let's stand.